So, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zum heutigen Vortrag. Hört man mich irgendwie? Halt so. Ähm, da der Vortrag in englischer Sprache ist, werde ich die Einleitung auch in englischer Sprache machen. Was ich etwas komisch finde, ist aber egal. Aber jedenfalls wird es so sein, dass in der Diskussion danach Deutsch, Englisch gefragt werden kann. Äh, Shalini Randerias Deutsch ist wesentlich besser als mein Englisch, also von daher sozusagen, wir können das auch in beiden Sprachen irgendwie halten. Okay, the title of tonight's talk will be Dispossession and Capitalist Development Designs, a few from India. For all those of you who know the history of political and historical sociology quite well, the first part of the title, and here the combination of nouns and terms such as dispossession, on the one hand, and capitalist development on the other, should evoke some very specific thoughts. It was indeed exactly 25 years ago when a nowadays famous book was published with a similar title, Capitalist Development and Democracy, by Dieter Hüschemeyer, Evelyn Huber Stevens, and John D. Stevens. The book, an enormously ambitious comparative study on democratization paths in many parts of the world, had one particular aim, to undermine the widely held belief that democracy has been fostered by the middle classes, that the middle classes have always been the defenders of democracy, and that democratic stability is dependent on a prospering middle class. Why this attack? The reason was rather simple. At least since the 1950s, when the modern social sciences became firmly established in the universities of the Western world, and when so-called modernization theory dominated the discourse on political development and democratization, it was always argued that historical analysis clearly shows that the middle classes, the Bürgertum, have been the decisive carriers of democratic projects. They have been the ones who, particularly in the 18th and 19th century, claimed civil and political rights against the aristocratic elites and who fostered rational political discourse due to their oftentimes academic background. In addition, the middle classes always felt themselves as a buffer between the aristocracy on the one hand and the peasants and the working classes on the other. And this in-between status guaranteed, so it was said, a kind of inclination towards a rather balancing and redeeming approach towards politics. The dominance of the middle classes seemed to be the best guarantee for a peaceful political culture, which also means, and this was an argument made over and over again, that continuous capitalist development will create a huge middle class and thus the preconditions for true democracy. Up until the 1990s, this argument was common sense for many social scientists at least until the aforementioned book was published. The three sociologists, at least two of them specialized in so-called non-Western regions of the world, had their doubts whether the middle classes have ever been and still are really such nice people, that we, as members of the middle classes, are really as good as we think we are. According to Rüschemeyer, who was Stevens and Stevens, the middle classes quite often had the interest to hinder the expansion of political rights to the lower classes. The middle classes often eagerly cooperated with dictators and oligarchies in order to prioritize their economic interests over the principles of democracy. If this is so, then the conclusion of the three sociologists was rather straightforward. Capitalist development alone does certainly not guarantee the preconditions of democracy. And even if we can observe the rise of middle classes in many parts of the world, this alone does not tell us very much about the future state of democracy. Capitalism as a system will turn out to be a milieu in which many different political projects can prosper, and it will depend on rather peculiar class constellations whether, in a particular country, democracy will prevail. Now, I don't want to get deeper in this highly interesting debate within political sociology although the rise of so-called populism nowadays would certainly deserve some remarks about the relationship between the good and nice middle classes on the one hand and the great unwashed on the other. 
But more important for our talk tonight should be the following observation. Although the debate on capitalist democracy within political and historical sociology was often quite a fierce and wild one, although there have been and still are very different opinions about the political effects of capitalist democracy, the odd thing is that hardly ever anyone in the warring camps had a closer look at what capitalist development really means. Most of the time, it was simply assumed that capitalism was and is a kind of smoothly running system with a peculiar logic that somehow gains control over societal relationships all over the world. Although capitalism might change its outlook over time, so that we can talk about, for example, industrial capitalism as easily as about digital capitalism, most analysts do not bother very much in looking into the way how the logic really works on the spot and, above all, how logical this logic really is. Most of the analysts, and I have to say also most of the speakers in our lecture series on the Bausteine des Kapitalismus, simply assume that there is a juridical system that somehow defines and guarantees property so that the smooth working of the capitalist process can be taken for granted. Although there once was primitive accumulation, as Karl Marx has pointed out more than 115 years ago, or there once was slavery, land grabbing and imperialism, nowadays these questions seemingly have been settled so that the capitalist logic sits on firm ground that guarantees its continuous functioning. But is it so? Maybe it only looks like that because most of us are used to analyze capitalism from a very Western point of view. But when we look into different parts of the world, is it really true that the rule of law, as we know it from the Western political tradition, has no problem whatsoever with the way how capitalism functions? Can we really assume that there is a state apparatus clearly separated from civil society which sets the rules for the accumulation of capital? Is it really the case that capitalism is dependent on a clearly structured legal system and beautifully designed institutions in order to function properly. There might be some doubts, and probably there's no one else within the social sciences who articulated these doubts in such a convincing way and from such a global perspective than Shalini Randere did and still does, our speaker tonight. Shalini Randere, who right now is the rector of the Institute of the Institute for the Wissenschaften von Menschen in Vienna and at the same time, research director and professor at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology in Geneva is one of the most influential and prominent anthropologists and sociologists of our time. She studied psychology and sociology, social anthropology at the University of Delhi in India and Oxford, and then became a true Berliner by writing her doctoral dissertation and habilitation at the Free University of Berlin. But her professional career was, of course, an international one, because she was not only a lecturer in India, but also held professorships in Munich, in Budapest, where she was the founding chair of the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology of the Central European University, an institution which is right now in huge difficulties, as you know, because of Viktor Urban's repressive politics. And she was also very important for the founding of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Zurich. Needless to say that Charlene Randieri had many, many honorable fellowships in various prominent institutions all over the world, which sometimes make it difficult to contact her because she always seems to be on the road in order to give talks or to chair advisory board meetings, as I have experienced. But despite her many journeys, one often forgets that Charlene Randieri was and is always an institution builder. As already mentioned, she is not only the director of the Institute for the Wissenschaft von Menschen, the Central European University in Budapest, and the Department of Anthropology in Zurich, all these institutions owe her a lot due to her manifold activities and initiatives. And besides all this administrative work, and I don't know how she does it, she's also a true inspiring scholar who is in some sense specialized in writing articles which aim at the very heart of different disciplines and become the center and focus of huge theoretical and also empirical debates. I certainly cannot deal with all her work, therefore I would like to highlight just a few 
of her publications, which will, will demonstrate the enormously broad scope of her research. Jenseits von Soziologie und kultureller Anthropologie zur Ortsbestimmung der nichtwestlichen Welt in einer zukünftigen Sozialtheorie, published in 1999, and thus more than 15 years ago, was one of the most prominent wake-up calls for German sociology at that time, and some would say even now, when sociology slept very comfortably on a rather Euro Eurocentric cushion. In 2001, she published an important essay on entangled histories of uneven modernities, where she coined the term of entanglement and thus opened new doors in the analysis of modernity. Whoever writes right now about modernity has to deal with the concept of entanglement, and Shalini Daria is one of those who really set this uh, topic at the center of research. She also, her work also has been characterized by the cooperation with many, many scholars in different disciplines, and since interdisciplinarity has always been so important to her, I would like to end my introduction by pointing to two edited volumes that had an enormous impact on the German social sciences in general and on history as a discipline in particular. In 2009, together with Andreas Eckert, she published From Imperialismus zum Empire, westliche, nicht westliche Perspektiven der Globalisierung, and four years later, and together with Sebastian Konrad and Regina Röhmhöldt, she co-edited Jenseits des Eurozentrismus, Postkoloniale Perspektiven in den Geschichts- und Kulturwissenschaften. As I have learned from reading her CV, she is also about to publish a volume together with Wiener Das and another one with Björn Wittrock, the sociologist and director of the famous CAS in Uppsala, Sweden, so that one realizes how eagerly even the most respected scholars in our disciplines seek to cooperate with Shalini Randieria. Shalini, thank you very much for coming. We are very proud that you are here. The floor is open to you. So thank you very much, Wolfgang, for this uh, very, very generous uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm sorry that on one of the few days on which the sun is shining in Hamburg, you are going to be subjected to capitalism in uh, India rather than be sitting outside uh, having coffee or a glass of wine uh, somewhere. Uh, I am afraid it's not going to be a very entertaining uh, uh, lecture. It's uh, a subject very close to my heart, but it's a subject which is rather dismal, as you will see uh, in a moment. If I'm too fast, uh, just give me <coughs> a sign, because, I mean, I have a manuscript, but I do tend to uh, go off uh, uh, at a galloping speed in English. Um, so I'll be careful, but uh, just raise your hand if you think I'm being too quick and unintelligible. So it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. It's my very first time at the uh, Institute uh, for Social Research. Uh, of course, Wolfgang and I go back a long way. We were assistants at the Free University uh, almost uh, at the same time. And I'm really pleased that we now have the opportunity for the two institutions, the Institute for the Wissenschaften von Menschen and uh, the Hamburg Institute for Social Research to cooperate on various projects, not the least the one on um, Bausteine des Kapitalismus. Now, I come to this entire topic at a tangent, and Wolfgang has said something about that to you. I come to it, one, from the historical perspective of entangled histories, which I will not go into here at all, and I come to it from the perspective of anthropology of the law and the state, which I will go into a little bit. But before I do that, let me start out by three preliminary observations, then give you seven building blocks of capitalism in India, and uh, then talk about uh, the state and the law. So some of it is my own research, but not so much of it this evening is going to be about my own empirical research, but feel free to ask uh, anything which you would like to know about in the discussion. <clears throat> 
I would like to take the opportunity to first talk about some of, in very broad terms, um, structural terms about some of the current transformations of capitalism in India, as well as some of the really heated and lively theoretical debates on the subject in India. Because the neglect of both issues for me in Euro-American academia is striking. I'm going to give you two completely randomly picked examples, but they came as a surprise to me. I took a look recently at Volkang Streich's How Will Capitalism End? Uh, essays on a Failing System, which you may know, he fails to mention India or China at all. Neither does Wolfgang Merkel in his much discussed piece, Is Capitalism Compatible with Democracy, where the India-China contrast could have been instructive to say the least. It is as if neither country is considered to belong to what both the authors call the capitalist world. Now, of course, some of you may know Deepesh Chakravarti's famous observation that this kind of ignorance of Western capitalism is something which no scholar in the non-Western world can afford to have. So there is an asymmetry of ignorance here, and this lecture is going to try to give you some of the background to capitalism, the key features of capitalism in India before I go on to make some very specific arguments. The Euro-American centrism of discussions on capitalism overlooks not only the historical entanglements of imperialism and the ways in which European capitalism itself is a product of this interaction with the Global South, but it also ignores the current dynamics of capitalism outside the West. China, for example, would present an interesting contrast to Angela Merkel's idea of market-conforming democracy. India would present an interesting contrast to Wolfgang Merkel's argument on the exclusion of the lower classes from the political process as inequality and poverty rises, because this is not true of India at all. Indian democracy has been saved time and again, not by the middle classes, who usually do not bother to go to vote, but it is the poor in India which have time and again made sure not only that they turn up, uh, at the ballot boxes in very, very large numbers, but they are the ones who overturn governments regularly. So this is a very interesting question as to why the poor vote in India, something which they do not do in large numbers in Europe anymore. The transfer of decision-making powers that Merkel talks about from the legislature to the executive or the decline in public services, which he notes as a feature of neoliberal globalization, seems to be universal. Equally so, the opening of the space for oligarchic philanthropy that whittles down citizenship's entitlements to a dependence on charity and on service provision by NGOs in what he calls an emerging new feudal relationship between private wealth and the public sphere. But this relationship takes very different forms in a welfare state or in a society structured by the caste system, and I think these could be very instructive comparisons. Now, of course, one could say, why should anybody here want to study India? And when I'm asked that, I often say, this is the question which Sir Edmund Hillary was one asked, once asked, why did he climb Mount Everest? And he said, because it's there. Uh, of course, so one could argue, it may be a good idea to study India and China just because they're there. But I think there would be some other good reasons to study capitalism in India and China, not the least because they are home to two-fifths of the world's population. So any discussion of the transformation of capitalism and its current crises, if it's not to render itself parochial, should include the experience of these countries. But let us recall one simple historical fact. In 1820, India and China contributed nearly half of the income produced in the world. In 1950, their share was down to one-tenth of the world's income, Currently, it's about one-fifth of the world's income, and the projection is that in uh, another 10 years, 2025, it'll be one-third of the world's income. So even if you discount much of the hyperbole in the financial press about Beijing and Bangalore as being the hubs of new capitalist development, overtaking, opposing a threat to their Western competitors, I think recent economic growth rates of 7 to 9% in both countries are remarkable. <laughs> 
If the earlier period of socialist control in China stifled initiative and shackled the economy just as it did in India, let us not forget that especially in China, the socialist period provided a good launching pad for the present state-controlled capitalist model by making available not only infrastructure but also an educated workforce. In comparison, the earlier period of a mixed economy in India had rather mixed results. Growing up in India, I remember that we were always told as children that Chinese were much better socialists than we Indians, and currently the Chinese are certainly better capitalists than Indians are. The pace and intensity of market-oriented Indian economic reforms since the 1990s, and that is when 1991 is when uh, the uh, country takes a structural, a very massive structural adjustment loan from the uh, IMF um, because of uh, a huge balance of uh, payment crises. Uh, the economic reforms initiated since that period have. Uh, had a huge impact on the policy regime and moved it to greater uh, reliance on private sector-led development and an increasing integration into the global economy. How much that has contributed to economic growth is a different question, and I'll go into that in a moment. One important legacy of the earlier era in both countries is the cumulative effect of the active role played by the state in technological development. I'm going to focus only on India, and that's, I think, enough given the size of the subcontinent and the complexity of the society and economy. Of course, given my own research interests, I will argue that despite the successful integration into the global economy in some sectors and a very enthusiastic embrace of entrepreneurial energy, it's necessary to look behind that to the complex interaction of markets with structural forces, positive and negative, which affect the lives of the poor. For hundreds of millions of poor people in India scrape out a precarious living, even now, from tiny family enterprises of extremely low productivity with little access to credit, to markets, to infrastructure or to education. So an important aspect of Indian capitalism that is inadequately researched, I'm going to mention two, which I'm not going to go into now, but I think they are worth thinking about because they usually fall off the radar. So one important aspect of Indian capitalism, which is little researched, is money laundering and capital flight of the rich. There is, so what I mean by this entire complex of things is there's a concealment of assets, legally or illegally gained, which are concealed in other businesses, including capital flight from India and going to jurisdictions which are more hospitable in terms of tax environment. A culture of silence accompanies this capital flight, um, which is both about extraction of profit and movement of, clandestine movement of capital. It's either done by internal transfer pricing, it's done through arrangements with traders and under-invoicing, it's done through a systematic underpricing, tax evasion of many varieties, uh, corrupt government contracts, kickbacks also on interestingly rigged arbitration proceedings. And so we have some very interesting journalistic accounts of investigative journalists who have interesting data on the kinds of different ways in which uh, this kind of clandestine accumulation of capital and its transfer abroad takes place. This is something which we know little about. I myself have done no research on it, but I just want to flag the issue. Another issue that I want to flag, because this is something which one is also, uh, need, which needs to be researched and we know very little about, is another dimension of new forms of commodification, and that is around the knowledge economy. So 2006, the Government of India formed the National Knowledge Commission to adopt what it called a knowledge-oriented paradigm of development to leverage the country's demographic advantage. So when I was a student, 1983, there were 120 universities in the country. 
2006, there were 367, 2012, 567 universities. And the increase in universities is due to private universities being set up. Private universities which have the status of charitable foundations, but which are actually profitable profit-oriented commercial enterprises. And I think this is one side of capitalist development, which capitalism and education is something which we know very, very little about. Two opposing narratives of neoliberalization of the Indian economy compete in the press and in academia. One is a very celebratory one, talking about India unbound, India shining, um, giving a new promise of a uh, golden opportunities for hundreds and thousands of capitalist entrepreneurs to emerge. The other is the very opposite, a highly critical narrative of the social and the ecological costs of jobless high growth in recent decades. Both narratives overlook the fact that agriculture still employs more than half the workforce in India. Even though there has been a sharp decline in agriculture's relative share of the national income, there's a decline in average farm size and productivity, along with rising costs of chemical and energy inputs. Soil erosion, water depletion have also led to a deterioration of the agricultural base, but powerful farm lobbies have ensured continued subsidies and there is no tax on agricultural income. If the pro-liberal, neoliberal economic narrative exaggerates the adverse effects of trade union laws on labor market reform, the anti-neoliberal narrative exaggerates the adverse effects of the weakening of trade unions on wages and job security. For let us not forget, trade unions in India represent a tiny fraction of industrial labor because 90% of the Indian labor force is in the so-called unorganized sector which basically should lead us to rethink what the relationship between organized and unorganized should be. So it, that's, this is a terminological, a classificatory issue. I return to this point in a moment. Suffice it to say that India has failed to achieve a massive expansion of labor-intensive manufacturing jobs of the kind that has transformed the Chinese economy. Many economists have held the rigidity of labor law responsible for this failure, but because of the statistics I just gave you, this is a diagnosis I find rather unpersuasive. Another explanation is that decades of reservation of more than 800 products in the Indian economy for small-scale industries, today it's down to just 40, has prevented using the economies of scale. But it's important to remember that small firms that provide, it is small firms that provide 90% of manufacturing jobs, although they only contribute one third of the total manufacturing output. So what I want to do is to outline a few features of Indian capitalism and then, as I said, look at some of the building blocks to it. One, it has a poorly educated, skilled, and poorly paid, casualized labor force. Secondly, there is a persistence and ubiquity of petty production, self-employment, and small family-sized businesses. Thirdly, there is a new capital which is aspiring to national markets, state and national capital, which is exporting surpluses internationally, but often in informal and underground economies. Fourthly, and this is something I'm going to go into in some detail, the particularity and the particular institutions of capitalism in India which make it distinct are the role of, is the role of the Indian state. Uh, this is something I want to discuss in a moment. The question of so-called primitive accumulation, Mark calls, calls it ursprüngliche accumulation, here should have been original accumulation. I don't know why immediately from the beginning in English it's been mistranslated as primitive accumulation, but that's the term which has stayed in English. And um, the forms of primitive accumulation have caused a very, very large debate in India, and that's what I want to come back to in the second part of my paper. Another very interesting feature of uh, uh, Indian capitalism are special economic zones, 
and I want to talk about them because special economic zones and the resistance to it is a feature of capitalism in the entire global south which needs looking at carefully because of the violent resource extraction and the displacement dispossession which goes to, uh, with it and the unevenness basically of the kind of accumulation that these uh, uh, ensure with uh, uneven combinations, uneven trajectories, and very uneven effects. So let me look at some of the varieties, institutions, and dynamics to give you a picture uh, before I go on to give you some ethnographic details. One. So after some deregulation of industry and trade liberalization in the late 1980s following the structural adjustment credit of the IMF, the pace of reforms accelerated 1990 onwards. These included the abolition of most licensing of industry, restrictions of entry or capacity restrictions for large firms, quantitative restrictions in trade and exchange control were abolished, foreign investment was made possible in many sectors of the economy, and there was a significant lowering and restructuring of direct and indirect taxes, the scaling down of import tariffs, and some reorganization and very little privatization, relatively, of public sector enterprises. The proportion of total trade to GDP went up from 16% in 1991 to more than 45% in 2010. The Indian economy, interestingly enough, weathered the 2008 global financial crises for two interesting reasons which economists have postulated. One, that the government of India had refused to give in to pressure from the IMF to make the rupee a fully convertible currency. And secondly, ironically, the huge amount of unaccounted for black money circulating especially in the real estate sector rendered banks partially immune to property price collapses, as the former chief economist of the government of India and the former chief economist of the World Bank, Kaushik Basu, recently pointed out. So it was black money which saved part of the economy, especially the banks. Protectionist anti-dumping measures, many aimed against China, continue, and a greater integration into the world economy brought in competition as some foreign direct investment came into the country and several of the Indian top corporations acquired business abroad. So Ardani, for example, brought, bought coal mines in Indonesia, is trying to buy coal mines in Australia. Uh, there's a huge amount of resistance to it from indigenous communities. Tata's bought Jaguar, much to the delight of the Indian middle classes. Mittal bought up steel companies in Spain, has sold them, I think, or some of them at least, in Italy and in East Germany. So Indian capital went global. And this is also a relatively understudied aspect of Indian capitalism. Um, a powerful state-owned sub-economy that has embraced liberalization but has had very limited privatization, state and state-backed power over the acquisition of land. This is something I'll talk about in a moment, and mineral resources. And a mass of regulative law, which is observed more in the breach than in practice, together with an economy that is socially regulated, such that rights-based redistribution projects which have been hard fought and also won for by NGOs and social movements have been the answer to the unprecedented violence of land acquisition in post-colonial India. Secondly, though there has been a decline in poverty, it's unclear how much is directly related to neoliberal economic policies. One reason for this is that, as I said, most of the country is not part of the organized corporate sector at all. 45% of non-farm output and 85% of non-farm employment are outside the organized sector, whether public or private. Indian economic growth is therefore, in the last decades, not manufacturing growth, but service sector growth. But even in the service sector, interestingly, it's primarily in the unorganized sector, in tiny enterprises which are actually below the policy radar, so to speak. Even if some of these firms act as subcontractors to large companies, 
it's unlikely that the foreign trade or regulatory policy reforms have affected these, the workings of these firms very much. Spillover effects of the communication revolution into the informal sector may have contributed to economic growth, a surprising example of which I will give you in the last section of my talk, which deals with the unexpected quarters from which innovations in the Indian economy come, blurring the fuzzy boundary between legality and illegality. Following Lawrence Leung, the Indian lawyer and legal activist, I described this process in the last section of the paper in the terms of porous legalities, a theme I'll come back to below. What I would also want to flag here are low levels of education and skills, low level of female labor participation. Don't forget, half of Indian women are still not literate and relatively weak infrastructure as dampers on growth. Large differences in education, social status, huge inequalities of land and wealth ownership persist and have acquired new salience, and there is little evidence of growing intergenerational mobility. Fundamental problems of service delivery in health and education mar basic improvements in these sectors, and social indicators are certainly not improving as fast as economic growth is. So there is high maternal and child mortality, high morbidity, skewed sex ratio, um, low education and employment for women, lack of clean drinking water, inadequate public hygiene, tremendous uh, amounts of air and water pollution, deforestation, land degradation. So there are some of the older problems compounded by some of the newer ones. Fourth, I argue with Saskia Sassen that the shift from Keynesianism and egalitarian nation-state-based systems to the global era of privatization, deregulation, and open borders for some entails a change from capital dynamics, and I quote Sassen, that brought people in to the dynamics that push people out. That is, as she calls it, and I quote her, a switch from incorporation to expulsion. The logic of inclusion was a concerted effort to bring the poor and the marginalized into the political and economic mainstream. The logic of accumulation by dispossession, as Harvey say, uh, uh, argues, renders large sections of the population superfluous with no possibility of absorption into the economy, a theme I come back to later. The rapid shift over the past 20 years from rain-fed cereal crops for the domestic market to non-food cash crops for export has led to a demand for cash for investment in buying seeds, fertilizers, and pesticide. One result is spiraling rural indebtedness reflected in large number of suicides by farmers. Fifth, the logic of free market, and I say in quote unquote, because we will see the kind of free market that has been put into place, often in the form of crony capitalism, is being put into place by the long arm of the state, through police, through bureaucracy, and also with the help of the judiciary, though the judiciary is also the site of resistance, as I will show. Dismantling of state-led import substitution model of industrialization led to high rates of growth. This is true. Uh, and this is what, you know, the Indian economist Raj Krishna used to call the Hindu rate of growth because 30 years long India had a rate of growth of 2 to 3 percent and whatever it tried, nothing improved it beyond 3 percent. And he said, so India has to be satisfied with this Hindu rate of growth. It's never going to go beyond the 3 percent. Post-liberalization, it has gone up to 8 to 9 percent. Now it's down to 7 percent, but that could be the envy of many a Western European economy. My own work over the last 25 years has focused primarily on the role of the state, but especially the role of the law in enabling a certain kind of capitalist transformation. So I have analyzed the patents on neem oil or on basmati rice as the new enclosures of the commons that secure intellectual property over biogenetic substances, but which violate the collective rights of farming communities 
both to seeds and to traditional knowledge of conservation. I have analyzed the ambivalence of World Bank credit conditionalities on resettlement and rehabilitation of those who are forcibly displaced in the course of an infrastructure project. But I have also studied the use of the law by local communities, by NGOs and social movements as the terrain on which to resist dispossession land grab or forcible eviction. I mean, just uh, to flag the whole issue of law, um, in his discussion of uh, primitive accumulation for Marx, this is central. If you remember Capital Volume 1, uh, he says, the advance made by the 18th century shows itself in this, and I quote, that the law itself becomes now the instrument of the theft of people's land, unquote. So this is uh, the use of law in Dispossession and accumulation is something which goes back to some of Marx's writings on, on the subject. I come back to that in a moment. The ways in which law structures lives and livelihoods uh, by both providing and curtailing access to resources, to land, to forests, to oceans, to mineral wealth, to ways in which people use the law to stake claims for citizenship, uh, the legal classification of lands or forests as commons, as individual property, as available for commercial exploitation. These are all questions that my empirical work has dealt with in great detail, just as it has analyzed the multiplicity of forums in which the struggles for justice are waged today, which sites of law are chosen by people and why. I looked at the blurred boundaries between legality and illegality. I'll come back to this in, when I deal with the question of piracy and copyrights. The way in which this blurred boundary is negotiated in the shadow of the law and against the law, and how people yearn for the state to observe its own laws, even though they protest against the content of that law and the violence with which that law is selectively implemented. Debates over capitalist development in India are often increasingly waged around the law, the making of the law, its interpretation, its implementation. This is what the Komarovs, Jean and John Komarov, called lawfare, or the use of law as a technology of control, which is symptomatic of the politics of a neoliberal world. My argument has been that law is Janus-faced. It has repressive qualities and it has an emancipatory potential. Legal knowledge can matter, both has ends and is means of action. Law provides both normative principles and strategic resources for social movements and for resistance, especially to the state, but also to international organizations. The use of law, I have shown in a lot of my work, stretches time. It delays projects, even if it cannot defeat them. It enables mobilization. But judicialization of protest comes at a price, and one of its risks is depoliticization. So contrary to Partho Chatterjee's very well-known argument, using the distinction between political society and civil society, where he makes the argument that law-abiding middle-class civil society uh, is something different from the political society which survives the society of the poor in the city through negotiated illegalities, I have often argued that urban middle classes, corporate capital and state administration violate laws in India with impunity, while the poor mobilize law as part of their politics in everyday life. So how daily life in India is constructed in and through engagements with law is something which has been one of my ethnographic preoccupations. How the rights to use and to own and to access resources have been legally framed in the past and present by the post-colonial state using laws of colonial origin and how internal contradictions in state law, legal plurality, overlapping laws, and fractured sovereignties, gray zones of legality and illegality or even indeterminacy of law, and the violations of law by the state. These are some of the kinds of themes which have preoccupied me in my own work. 
I don't know if you recall the 2004 report by the World Bank titled Initiatives in Legal and Judicial Reform. This is a very interesting report because it slips the private sector promotion into the very definition of the rule of law. And I quote from the report, it says, rule of law requires transparent legislation, fair laws, predictable enforcement, and accountable governments to maintain, order, promote private sector growth, fight poverty, and have legitimacy. So some Indian economists have taken this World Bank vision, of course, very seriously and have uh, enthusiastically embraced it. One example is uh, someone like Vivek Dev Roy, who in his uh, uh, work uh, with the title, uh, he has an article called, Is the Present Legal System Conducive to Market-Based Behavior? And in this, uh, uh, in the standard neoliberal account, such as his legal reform, transparency, simplicity enables corporations to be law-abiding. It frees them from the shackles of arbitrary state power and discretion by removing the constraints of labor laws, environmental laws, etc. It uh, now allows them, enables them to uh, promote growth and the allows best practices to be transplanted worldwide, brought market-friendly laws and models can be brought from one country to the other. The particular trajectory of capitalism in India has involved financial concessions, intransparent deals, and also a very selective application of laws. This is where I've developed in this connection something I'm not going to do today. I've published a lot on it, the idea of the cunning state, and I make the argument that the Indian state is not best understood in the dichotomy of a strong state or a weak state, but it's a cunning state, cunning in that it is able to be selectively weak and pretend to be much weaker in areas in which it wants to absolve itself of accountability. So this is a longish argument which I make using empirical material in many cases to try and show that if welfare states are about sharing of risks, cunning states are about the sharing of responsibility such that at the end of the day nobody is accountable for any decision making. So all unpopular decisions can be laid to the door of the World Bank. The World Bank then will say, but our members are sovereign states which have made these decisions. And as a citizen, one is sent between international organizations and nation states not knowing whom to render answerable for the kinds of decision making that one is protesting against. Courts have been a major terrain on which a lot of the fight in India, a lot of the struggles in India have taken place in order to realize Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which is the right to life, interpreted especially by the Supreme Court as the right to life with dignity, which would include the right to food, right to shelter and water, right even, says the Supreme Court, to a clean environment. Given the multiple orders of state and suprastate law, we are faced here not only by a plurality of legal fora, but also a large amount of legal indeterminacy, besides the old problems of access to justice, which remain unresolved. I mentioned one other building block of capitalism in India, as in almost all countries of the global south, but Greece is an equally good example, and which is, unlike Western Europe, the role of the IMF and the World Bank, the role of international organizations in promoting a certain model of neoliberal capital develop capitalist development is something which needs to be seen in the interaction with the state. So you cannot leave out the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, etc., the Asian Development Bank in the Indian case, as lenders, lenders who are um, imposing certain policy prescriptions on the state as part of the story of what kind of capitalist development takes place. Um, sixth, I want to make the argument that neoliberal economic policies are put into place by administrative fiat, not by legislative deliberation. And this is part of the reason for the depoliticization of a lot of issues that we are seeing on in all of these countries. So the uh, 
entire apparatus of neoliberal policies was put in place in India without any legislative discussion at all. The entry of private capital into sectors hitherto reserved for public sector like mining, the opening of sectors reserved for Indian companies like the insurance sector, retail trade, banking, etc. Um, these were all policy measures which were put in place through administrative fiat. The entry of multinational corporations certainly raised wages in some sectors but also meant a resistance to trade union activities. So it's my contention that the nexus between the state and private corporations is key to understanding the growth rates in India and China, but the nexus functions very differently in both these countries. This deserves much longer treatment. I'm going to just give you a few pointers and we can go into it um, in the discussion. With only half the economy under private ownership in China, the state controls the larger profitable companies in the industrial and service sectors. The state-owned enterprises are highly commercialized. The Indian private sector has a much longer history, also deeper roots. It's more vigorous and I think even more autonomous than in China, despite a heavily regulated economy. The a formal sector in India, even today, consists of state-owned companies, which account for 40% of sales. Since the liberalization of the economy following the structural adjustment loan, the private sector is certainly thriving, but it's the service sector which contributes 55% of GDP in India. But within it, it's the informal sector that dominates, and without, that is, in farming and non-agricultural household enterprises, that is what accounts for 94% of the labor force in India. So many of the stories about Indian liberalization don't hold true when you look at these very, very fundamental statistics. Many of these businesses operate in what the Indian economist Pranar Bardhan has called, and I quote him, the interstices of a low productivity, involuted economy, the capitals parts of which cannot absorb them. And that's something that I want to come to in a moment. In Japan or South Korea, if these are examples of coordinated capitalism, where the nation state presided over and encouraged the coordination of decisions among private business conglomerates, Indian capitalism has functioned very differently, as I have tried to show. In this contradistinction to China, the Indian diaspora has played a hardly significant role in the development of the Indian economy, much to the disappointment of the Indian state, which has made all kinds of efforts to woo so-called non-resident Indian capital uh, since 1990. Elite fragmentation, electoral populist politics have also worked to some extent against the very tight links between business and bureaucracy that have marked East Asian capitalism. Since the liberalization of the Indian economy, this has changed a little bit. Courts and bureaucracy have become more pro-business. The Supreme Court in a land acquisition case has even gone so far as to declare private industry to be public purpose because it provides employment. Despite liberalization, regional governments in India hold considerable power over firms, not only in granting land and granting land at highly concessional prices, but also giving water and electricity connections, environmental clearances, etc., whereby environmental clearance and land acquisition have been the most contentious issues with civil society actors uh, protesting in those two areas against the setting up of special economic zones. One last point, and then I come to my final uh, uh, argument. I have always maintained that the policy of the Indian state on development has led to millions of so-called development refugees, that this policy is therefore ecologically and socially unsustainable. Since 30 years, I have worked with those who have been forcibly displaced, farmers, forest dwellers, pastoralists, fishing communities, all of them displaced from villages or even urban slums by the building of dams and power plants, nuclear plants and airports, military bases, special economic zones, or those who have lost their homes and their villages due to the rapacious extraction of mineral wealth as well as the modernization of urban infrastructure. <clears throat> 
the ecological myopia of this unsustainable model of capitalist modernity in a post-colonial context would need separate treatment. I have focused in my work on the social costs of this tearing apart of the social fabric, but without that population rendered surplus being absorbed into urban or industrial proletariat, and I come to that debate in a moment. The most significant, st so just so that you have an idea of the scale of things, land acquisition by the Indian state has forcibly displaced about 500,000 poor people every year in India since 1947. So it's a scale of displacement which is just huge. It's among the largest in the world, 500,000 people per year since independence, 47. A significant structural change that has furthered what Saskia Session calls expulsion or Harvey terms accumulation by dispossession is epit epitomized by the special economic zones on the Chinese model. So I have been researching the setting up of one particular SEZ in Gujarat in Western India, one of 571 approved SEZs which cover 140,000 hectares, duty-free and tax-free enclaves across the country. These are modern-day enclosures. They are deemed foreign territory for purposes of trade, tariffs and duties, which are also exempt, also they're not only exempt from tariffs, taxes, and duties, import duties, but they are also exempt from labor and environmental laws. They occupy thousands of hectares of common forest land, coastal land, fertile farmland or grazing land. Farmers are forced to sell their land either to corporations directly at lower than the market price or to the government which acquires land for the corporation. And the SEZ policy has been followed by all governments in power in India from the left to the right. The dynamics of this corporate land grab on a massive scale are those which really require close scrutiny. And that's uh, something uh, that I want to do in a uh, moment just so that you see what is happening in uh, these special economic zones which represent a microcosm of the spatial and temporal inequalities that have been the hallmark of Indian capitalist development. This, Their establishment has been accompanied by widespread economic dislocation, social disintegration, destruction of livelihoods and forcible displacement. The SEZ Act, interestingly, was uh, passed in 2005, the same year which saw two other very interesting pieces of legislation in India. One, the Right to Information Act, and two, the National Employment Guarantee uh, Act. Uh, both of the other two legislations, the um, uh, National Rural Employment uh, uh, Generation Act and the Right to Information Act, were followed by protracted debate in Parliament because these were legislations which came from below, from civil society. The impetus for these legislation, the content of this legislation was something which civil society actors pushed through Parliament. The Special Economic Zone Act, which came from above, which came from the government, passed hurriedly through Parliament without any debate at all. So what does this act um, do? The act allows the setting up of special economic zones, carving out territory out of the national territory, and allow all kinds of concessions in tax regimes. So for the first uh, five years, there's a 100% tax concession, the next five years, a 50% uh, tax concession, the next five years, 50%. But these are all moving goals because then the companies keep negotiating with the government. And this is an act uh, whose implementation is under construction. And so over the years, further and further, uh, you can call it a process of permanent reform in favor of um, the uh, corporate uh, uh, profit making. So there's a continuous amendment of rules and regulations as governments try to keep um, uh, corporations happy. One way to describe them rather dramatically would be to say these are corporate fiefdoms. This is rentier capitalism at its best. 
Here, ordinary citizens are stripped of their rights, and you have a neoliberal extremism in which business groups are accorded complete control over the governance of this particular territory. It goes so far as even allowing them self-certification when conducting tax-exempt uh, uh, export business. So they are meant to create investment incentives. Foreign direct investment has hardly been attracted to these uh, special economic zones from abroad. Most of it is domestic Indian capital. And it is attracted by the fact that it has to pay no capital goods tax on raw materials or capital good imports, no import duty, no taxes. It is allowed to initiate joint ventures with 100% foreign equity, uh, etc. Interestingly, three kinds of businesses have been set up in the special economic zones, IT and IT-based services, jewelry and gems, and pharmaceuticals. None of these are uh, labor-intensive industries. So the SEZs in India have hardly generated employment. Uh, so this is a, a separate uh, story. Much of the opposition to um, uh, the SEZs has consisted in litigation. The litigation has been effective in affecting delays in implementation, but neither in getting just compensation for the land or the livelihoods lost, nor in penalizing corporations for the violation of environmental laws or in penalizing governments or government officials for procedural violations. Most cases have gone from the High Court to the Supreme Court. One of the standard lines of arguments has been, okay, so the industry has violated all of these uh, environmental laws, but now that it has invested so much money, if we do not permit the industry to be set up, there will be a loss too of capital. So the way most corporate houses have proceeded is large-scale violations of all laws and then post facto regularization of those violations in the name of large-scale investment. And the courts have gone along with that in a lot of cases. The number of environmental law cases had mounted so much that separate green tribunals, so-called green tribunals, were set up as parallel courts in order to deal with these cases. And then one green tribunal in Delhi wasn't enough, so now there are different regional uh, um, uh, uh, green tribunals. One of the major vexed question here is, what happens if the state acquires land? The SEZ is sanctioned and approved and it never really starts business. Because a lot of corporate houses have used the SEZ Act in order to acquire vast tracts of land and not to put it to any profitable use at all. And the question is, it lapses according to law, but when it lapses, whom does the land go back to? Because it's now been acquired by the state. So can it return to the original owner despite the fact that the original owners have been compensated, however badly? The law at the base of land acquisition, interestingly, was all these years, the 1894, the British 1894 uh, Colonial Land Acquisition Act, which the post-colonial state was using. It used the category of public purpose without ever having defined what public purpose was. And um, this has been uh, challenged uh, by uh, social movements, NGOs, and uh, uh, communities protesting against the acquisition of their land, invoking environmental concerns. Invoking environmental concerns has always been a double-edged sword because one of the arguments which can be used to brush aside an environmental argument is to say, but jewelry and gems or IT services are not polluting industries. So actually, if you are opposing these industries, then you are either a Luddite anti-developmentalist or worse, you are anti-national. So making an environmental argument always comes with this danger of being confronted with the fact that this is a non-polluting industry. The opponents then are sought to be delegitimized in sort of terms of their being anti-national. Uh, 
and the key actor in most of the successful opposition to SEZs have been NGOs, which have been able to mobilize the local community, forge pan-Indian links, marshal resources for litigation, provide technical expertise, and link up also with local landowners who have lost their um, uh, uh, sources of income. Interestingly, often opposition has been framed in cultural terms, in terms of the loss of local identity against outsiders. And you may start now fantasizing about who these outsiders may be, but in most of these cases, the outsider is anybody who doesn't belong to the village. So uh, the entire uh, opposition is framed in terms of very local idioms, the corrupting influence of outsiders, um, using uh, local vernacular language, idioms, symbols, and file court cases, on the other hand, in litigation against environmental law violations or procedural irregularities. This uh, is, a, is a, it's a, a long and complicated story, how uh, these cases are fought in different fora and why the environment becomes uh, such a major issue because I think one should remember, and that's uh, with that I want to end this particular part of the argument, the environment in India, ecological issues in India are always issues of livelihood. They are never purely uh, environmental concerns, but they always go to the heart of the question of whether the poor are able to survive and survive in an environment with a life of dignity, with the kinds of skills and with the kinds of resources which they have access to. But one reason why the SEZs, I think, have become such a large symbol of um, global uh, capitalism is the fact that, uh, and they are one of the primary building blocks of capitalism in the global south, including, and here global south includes Eastern Europe in my view, because don't forget, it's one quarter of the world's manufacturing which takes place in 5,000 such zones all over the world, and these zones alone employ more than 40 million people. In India, the primary employment is male. Uh, in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka, the primary employment is women in special economic zones. So it's a very gendered workforce. This has all kinds of uh, interesting implications. But SEZs are the stuff of global dreams. And as Iva Ong has um, uh, argued, and they are the stuff of global dreams because they are about planned cities, uh, Californian-style uh, landscaped gardens, uh, the symbol of modernity and economic progress. But as Iva Ong has argued, they are also the instruments for disciplining a certain kind of labor force. And with that, I come to my pre-penultimate argument, and that is the whole question of the theoretical debate in India on um, primitive accumulation and on the nature of capitalism. So two debates I just want to flag here to show that the kinds of issues which are being debated are probably at the heart of the debate on capitalism in the Global South. One is Sudipto Kaviraj's theorization on the dilemmas of democratic development in post-colonial societies, and that goes back to what uh, Wolfgang Knobel was saying right at the beginning, which he f has framed recently in an article in the European Journal of Sociology on the revisionist theory of modernity. And the central idea which he has here is of sequentiality. And he makes the argument that there are different constellations of capitalist modernity depending on the sequence of industrialization, capitalism, democracy, individuation, secularism. And he says, in post-colonial societies, democracy, as in India, democracy uh, as an ideal, and sometimes even as institutions, preceded rather than followed individuation and industrial capitalism, as it did in the West. So the discourse of democracy and democracy as an ideal, the liberal discourse of rights, appears in India, he argues, alongside anti-colonial nationalism, much prior to individuation and to capitalist industrialization. So trade unions and labor movements are there 
right from the early years of capitalism in India, thus limiting the capacity of capitalism to produce a disciplined working class right from the beginning. And so despite two centuries of colonial rule and over one century or more of the Land Acquisition Act of 1894, India remains largely a rural and agricultural economy. And capitalism's capacity to tear apart rural communities and turn them into urban industrial proletariat, as Marx would have us believe in capital, uh, in primitive accumulation, has been rather limited. So it's a very different trajectory of capitalist development. This is something which Kalyan Sarnyal picks up in his very, very well-argued book in 2007, where he makes the argument that where Harvey is, David Harvey is wrong, he says, is that he neglects the formation of the labor force and he neglects the fact that the seizure of resources has a productive purpose. That is, it's the building block of capitalism. The problem as he argues, however, in countries like India, but in all post-colonial societies, is that the capitalist economy is unable to absorb those who are now rendered waste or superfluous in the rural agricultural economy. And here comes now the major dissents in the Indian debate on those who argue that these are remnants of pre-capitalist or these are non-capitalist forms. And this is where one of the major debates, um, uh, theoretical debates, uh, has been. Uh, uh, Kalyan, uh, uh, Sanyal arguing that therefore they must engage in non-capitalist um, uh, forms uh, of production because the capitalist domain is unable to uh, absorb them at all. And we have new subsistence uh, economies. He makes a, a, a distinction between accumulation versus the need economy. And he says the entire development developmentalist state apparatus is to take care of those rendered superfluous by this kind of accumulation, uh, by dispossession. But he, as I said, differs uh, very strongly in, uh, from Harvey here. Someone like Aditya Nigam, on the other hand, has pointed to the fact that it's the strength of the ecological movements today which makes it impossible to uproot rural communities wholesale. And so capitalism in the periphery has to confront democracy in a way that capitalism in the center in Europe didn't have to. And the history of democratic protest and struggles makes for a different uh, kind of texture of capitalism, uh, one that cannot discipline a labor force, one that cannot subsume those rendered superfluous, ones who escape the logic of capitalism. And I want to come to that in the final uh, part here by just giving you one example, uh, which uh, Aditya Nigam points to, and he says, this is the 21st century's anxiety about piracy, a non-capitalist way of living, sharing the pleasures of consumption rather than adhering to the logic of profit. And these are the mechanisms, the discontinuities of capitalism where different logics coexist, and that this, in his argument, is not a matter of an incomplete transition to capitalism, a deficient capitalism, like the modernization theory, if you like, but rather these non-capitalist forms are endogenous to capitalism and are products of a certain kind of capitalism. So this is the informal survivalism of the poor, and it shows you that capitalism does not have the power to transform fully everything in its wake, the power that we usually attribute to it. And let me come to my uh, final uh, point uh, here. I just want to make a quick point on piracy to just show you what kinds of porous legalities there are that we are uh, talking about uh, here. And I just want to, it's a very randomly chosen example, uh, but it's an example, I think, which is striking. So I think it may be interesting to think the problem through. And that is of cassettes. I think all of us have forgotten music cassettes. In the 70s and 80s, we used to use them. Uh, for those of you who are of a different generation, you don't even know what they are. Uh, but uh, we grew up uh, with them in, uh, in uh, India. So I want to look at the world of cassettes to do something, to think about the ad hoc world of innovation, which is based on porous ideas of legality. And here I follow Laurence Liang's argument uh, 
And uh, interestingly, for those of you who've ever been to India, you will have noted 70% of software in India is uh, illegal. It's in fact, it's almost impossible to get legal software in India. You buy a computer and you say to the guy who delivers it uh, uh, when it comes with all the Word and Excel, et cetera, et cetera, and you say, uh, but this is not licensed. And he says, madam, nothing ever is. And uh, then you say, uh, is it possible to get licensed software? He's, and he looks at you in complete consternation and says, why? And you say, uh, because this is illegal. And he says, for whom? And this conversation can take you half an hour. It gets you nowhere. Uh, and uh, so it's almost impossible to get a uh, uh, license software. Uh, so uh, here I want to talk about a circulation of music, uh, because I have a very interesting uh, story here. These are Ravi Sundaram has uh, written a, a wonderful account of this, and he reminds us that pirate electronic networks are part of what he calls a bleeding culture, constantly marking and spreading in urban life. It's part of a culture of dispersal, and it's a nightmare to classify. Unquote. The 1980s in India saw the proliferation of music, beginnings with the cassette player boom of the 1970s. They were not made in India. Uh, those of us who studied abroad at that time, like myself, um, in the 80s, I remember buying my first cassette player. I had to pay duty on it. I brought it back to India as a student. I had to pay customs duty on it. And most of the cassette players, the Japanese ones, were coming with Indian migrants coming back from the Gulf. This was the major symbol of affluence, and it was an object of modern desire. This fueled a whole market in pirated cassettes for film music, but also regional language songs, devotional music uh, with the rise of Hindu gurus and gods, etc., which paralleled the opening of the economy. Now, the vignette which I want to give you is of, uh, and I, I uh, narrate this story from Lawrence Leung's article. Uh, he talks about the maverick entrepreneurs and business uh, on the business skills of two young Indian men, Subhash and Gopal Arora, who run a fruit juice shop in Delhi. And they are both interested in electronics and they like listening to music and they start a small studio to record regional language songs which has no market until then because the songs are all in Hindi, in the national language. They borrow money to make a trip to Japan, to Hong Kong and to Korea to study the cassette industry. On their return, they take a loan to set up a small factory to make magnetic tapes this is so successful, they start making cassettes. This becomes so successful, they start offering duplication services. By the late 1980s, they have their, their company is called T-Series. It has become a market leader. It's currently worth over 150 million rupees. It's diversified into televisions, videos, etc., and now makes washing machines and detergents as well. Now, why porous legality? And this is a really interesting thing, because using the version of the recording clause in the Copy Indian Copyright Act, they started with Bollywood film songs, but sung by a different voice. And therefore, they were not violating copyright, because the songs were the same, but they were sung by somebody different. Then they came up with this genius idea of a totally different distribution network. You, they started selling these cassettes through grocery shops, tea shops, um, uh, your uh, neighborhood uh, retail shops, etc. And of course, then once it got so successful, they decided infringement of copyright they could afford because they could either pay the bribes to the tax enforcement agency, which was lax in any case, or people wouldn't notice. Then they got so powerful that they started negotiating with the recording companies who found that they were quicker at marketing their songs than the companies themselves were. And so they got into business with the major companies whose songs they were pirating, who were now paying them to sell their pirated songs on their cassettes. Since then, they had really built an empire. They decided that the best thing was to undercut all of these brand names. So they illegally inserted poor quality tapes into the well-known brands to discredit the uh, reputation of these established firms. And so on the story goes. Vacillating between legality, illegality, gray zones of legality, by then, they had created a huge million 
strong market desire and demand for cassette consuming public and then well-known labels came to them and colluded with them. And then, interestingly, T-Series now today is an aggressive enforcer of their own copyrights. So it now employs retired police officers to uh, monitor the infringement of their own copyrights and the publics it caters to lie outside of the liberal assumptions of a public sphere, of a rule of law, in a highly unequal geography of cultural production and consumption. Interestingly, this is not an ideological opposition of the copyleft movement. These are people for whom it is about righting the wrongs of unequal access they are asking for the right to be included in a global modernity by use of this kind of pirated project. This is not about the right to ownership. This is not about the right to possession. This is just a right to enjoy, to circulate and share and be part of this particular dream of belonging to a global middle class. And I think this is something that if we, if we try and understand the dynamics of this kind of capitalist uh, transformation uh, in a vignette, it shows you something about the nature of the questions we need to ask about law, about property, about the state, about the nature of innovation, about new publics, and about tangible, intangible property and the kinds of capital it needs in order to understand something about the nature of capitalism in modern India. Thank you.